my name is Phil. I'll be your host this evening. Um, and um, this evening, we have got a great event for you. Really, really good event. So welcome to all of those who regularly join us. And there are an increasing amount of people who regularly join us for these events. And for those who are newcomers, and I can see there are quite a few newcomers um, from just where you're from, from the US, from New Zealand, etc. Welcome, big welcome. I hope you enjoy this evening. I think it's going to be a really, really good show. Sipping Rooms is all about um, getting behind the scenes in distilleries, understanding the characters behind the, the gins, understanding what motivates the owner to actually create the gin in the first place. We talk to the distillers, we see the stills. Importantly, we have a fantastic um, mixologist who's going to show us how to make some cracking gin. So for you, you, those of you who've already got a bottle of sorghum and some ingredients, we're going to make those, make those cocktails. If you don't, and if you've joined, joined late and you haven't had time to get to the bottle, don't worry, that's fine. Hopefully we'll be as entertaining as possible so you can sit there and watch us make fools of ourselves make, trying to make some cocktails. It's always in, entertaining to see people all around the world meet, um, mixing up cocktails um, and cheersing each other. So that, that'll be um, hopefully some entertainment for those of you who don't have the bottle. But anyway, um, this evening we are featuring Salcom, Salcom Distillery Company. And um, it's been really amazing to get these guys on board for Sipping Rooms. Um, they are an incredible distillery. Um, I got introduced to Salcom Gin a couple of years ago and it's immediately, as soon as I, I had my first Salcom, I was like, wow, this is really a, a distillery which is about perfection. And uh, when they agreed to come on to Sipping Rooms, I was very, very chuffed indeed. So, um, yeah, we will be going down to Devon to actually meet uh, Angus and the team soon. But a few bits of housekeeping first. So. Um, for you, those of you who don't know, um, you get you can get the chance to um, have a kind of Q and A um, with the uh, distiller and with Angus, who's the owner of Salcom Distillery, at the end. So uh, some people have already sent in uh, some questions. If you want to ask questions during the the event, uh, you can go down to the bottom of your uh, of your screen. There's the chat function there. And you can uh, type in your type in your question. And if we have time, hopefully we can ask that. At the end of the show, when we do this Q and A, we tend to open up the mics as well, so that people can actually ask in person. So that's with um, depending on how many people we have on at that time and how busy it is, you um, might be able to ask in person. So that's great. Uh, the other thing, which is the feature to keep your attention throughout the evening is the fact that we run a competition so you can actually you can be in the running to actually get one of these delivered to you win it and uh, the way you do this is the first person to recognize a phrase or a word which is said three times now it's not i, I always say this it's not something ordinary like copper still or something like that which will probably be said quite a few times it's going to be something slightly offbeat and unusual and that could be said by me it could be said by angus it could be said by richard it could be said by jason so that it's not one particular person who's going to say it, it could be all said in the first five minutes it could be one once at the beginning uh, once in the middle once at the end so you've just got to keep your ears open for it but if you do think you've um, heard the phrase three times or the word three times again put your put it into the chat and it will come up um saying you know say i think the phrase is boom i think that the word is this and the first person to do that will be recognized and will hope will win a bottle of uh, sorghum so um yeah, I think this evening, I don't seem to have heard anybody who's not on mute, which is great. Um, so I think 
Charlie behind the scenes is doing an excellent job muting everybody. But if you, if you do happen to see that you're not on mute, please do put yourself on mute. So the, the, red, the running order for this evening, um, we're going down to uh, Devon, down to Sorkham. Um, Angus is going to take us through the actual uh, tasting the gin. So you need to get your, get your glasses ready, get them charged up. Um, but he'll be doing that quite soon. He'll be taking us through the, the, the whole makeup of, of the gin. Then he's going to do the perfect serve of, of, of um, the gin. Take us through a bit of the background around the distillery. Then we're going to start on our first cocktail. So we're going to come, come back to, to London to meet Richard, who's going to take us through our first cocktail. After that, we go back to Devon to Jason, who's the master master distiller and he's going to take us through all the magic which makes um Sorkham distillery uh so special then back to london for our second cocktail with richard and finally back to Sorkham again to see um angus and jason they're going to do a bit of a behind the scenes about their their gin school we're going to see some special stuff um, around casks, etc. And then finally, we're all going to kick back, relax, and have Q and A with Angus and Jason. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce you to Angus, who we were going to be outside um, the distillery, but apparently the Devon weather has hit. So we're, going to, we're just going to start off inside unless things have changed over the last uh, 10 minutes. But I think we're going to go straight down to Angus. And uh, yeah, we'll be introduced to him by the magic of is Angus there. Here we go, and he's outside. He is outside, fantastic. Is the rain finished now, Angus? Oh, you're on, we on mute, one second. We can't, I can't hear you. Um, Charlie, can we unmute Gus, please? There we go. Oh. He was unmuted for a millisecond there. And there we go. You're can on. you hear me? Yes, sorry, sorry. Brilliant. Probably the okay, Dev Devon fantastic. Rain getting in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, many thanks for the introduction, Phil. Uh, my name's Angus. I'm the co-founder of Solcombe Distilling Company. Uh, and I'm here in what should be nice, sunny Solcombe. But uh, as you can see, looking behind me, uh, it is somewhat uh, wet this evening, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, when we set this all up to, uh, to film a little bit earlier on, it was nice and dry, and there was actually a little bit of blue sky. But um, uh, sadly, as I'm literally just standing outside the rear doors of the uh, distillery, uh, and it's starting to come down quite hard, the rain. So, but uh, welcome and many thanks for tuning in. So what I hope will be a fun, informative, and engaging hour uh, with uh, myself. Uh, I'll also be joined by our master distiller, um, Jason, as well, and uh, Richard, our brand ambassador uh, from London, who will be shaking up some amazing cocktails as well. So. I guess the first order of business, if you haven't already done so, is to pour yourself a drink. Uh, I'm sure you've all probably got a drink in hand. Um, I'll be uh, talking through um, our gin, Rosé Saint-Marie, uh, which is the main gin we're going to talk about this evening. Um, and I'm going to do a, a, a tasting as well. Um, so for those of you who have already poured yourself a Rosé Saint-Marie and tonic, fantastic. Uh, if you have a smaller glass, a tasting glass, uh, something kind of like this uh, size, either a, a sherry glass, small wine glass, or perhaps a whiskey nosing glass. Then, if you just pour yourself a small amount uh, into that glass as well, and then I will um, guide you through a bit of a tutored tasting uh, about our gin. Uh, so, I'll start outside here whilst I'm not getting too wet, uh, just to tell you a little bit about um, our brand. So, we um, uh, Salt and Distilling Company, uh, myself and my business partner Howard, uh, we founded the company in, in 2014, in summer 2014, actually July. I've still got the picture of our, our original meeting when we decided to be...
why not start a uh, distillery? Uh, both had a, a big passion uh, for gin and distillation. Um, and then when they set about and spent the, last, the next 18 months um, doing lots of fun things, uh, including building a distillery that I'm stood in here now, which is actually one of the only uh, distilleries in the world you can directly access by boat. So you can actually see behind me, as you see the tide is in at the moment, and you can bring your distillery right up to uh, the rear of the, um, so bring your boat right up to the rear of the distillery. Uh, in the background, just behind me, um, for those of you who know Solcombe, uh, it's very famous for a number of things that we'll be talking about uh, this evening, uh, including uh, crab. Uh, so that's actually the crab, uh, known as Crab Key, uh, behind me, uh, where they process uh, an enormous amount of brown crab. We're very fortunate down here to have such an amazing supply of uh, shellfish, uh, particularly uh, brown crab, uh, which is exported all around the world, uh, a huge amount out to China uh, as well. Um, and so whenever you come to Solcum, um, uh, you definitely try a, a crab sandwich or crab in anything. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. So as I said, we started the company in, uh, in 2014 and we actually launched Solcum Gin with our first product start point in 2016. Uh, and we spent 18 months <coughs> creating uh, the recipe, um, uh, which was a lot of fun, a lot of blind tastings, normally about 10 o'clock in the morning um, uh, when your palate's at its best. Um, and also building this uh, fantastic distillery, um, which is actually a, a boathouse. Um, it was set, built on the site of the old um, Island Cruising Club Sailing Club, uh, which is actually where um, uh, I learned to sail and met my business partner, Howard, uh, as we were both sailing instructors there uh, in, our, in our late teens. So it's kind of come full circle that here we are in this amazing uh, location uh, in what is normally a sunny uh, part of the world. Um, uh, having built the distillery here on this site. Um, so I would like to carry on giving the chat, but I'm starting to get a little bit wet over here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to step behind the bar and we're going to cut to uh, another camera and then I'll give you a, a tutored tasting. So Phil, if you could, or Lawrence, if you could just put me, cut to Matt's camera, that would be great. No problem at all. Okay. That was uh, good to see the actual setting of Salkham because I think that's amazing. I mean, what other distillery can you go to, have a few of these, and then get in your boat? Um, I think uh, if you've got a boat, that is, which I don't. But um, yeah, absolutely stunning liquid, I think. Amazing, so much on the nose. And I can't wait to see what Angus's perfect serve is. I think it's got to be probably a slightly more sophisticated than my one, which was just uh, a bit of uh, tonic on top of some sulcum. Um, is uh, Angus ready now? Yes, he is. He's behind the bar. Fantastic. Let's cut back to Angus and he'll show us our perfect serve. Uh, that is if he is off mute. I think he is. You hear yeah. me? Great. Fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm here. Fantastic. Okay, well, um, um, this is our, our fantastic tasting bar um, here in Salkham. So literally only a few uh, meters from where I was standing um, a couple minutes ago. Um, and as you guessed it, uh, we serve predominantly uh, gin here, um, and we have our kind of full range uh, of gins um, in stock here behind the bar. Uh, but obviously, this evening I'm going to be uh, providing a tutor tasting of uh, Rosie Samory and basically providing the perfect serve. So, if everyone's got a kind of bottle behind them, and whilst I'm doing this, I'll be talking a little bit about about our gin and and, and how we uh, started. Uh, this fantastic uh, journey that we've been on. So, first things first, I've poured myself a, a small uh, tasting measure here of, um, of Rosé Saint-Marie. So, this is actually our kind of second main gin uh, that we've created. We started out creating an amazing gin called Start Point uh, that we launched with in uh, July 2016. Um, and that is very much a classic citrus-led uh, London dry gin. Um, when we started the uh, the, the company. We really wanted, there are a lot of you know, companies producing what I would call fad gins, uh, trendy gins, uh, and actually we wanted, to, we set out to create something that will stand the test of time. Um, we thought if we can create an amazing um, uh, London dry uh, style of gin, uh, particularly citrus leg. Um, so luckily Howard and I were um, of, uh, both favoured citrus leg gins uh, that, that we that probably just as well, otherwise we would have had to go into two gins. Um, 
And down here in Solgum, I mentioned obviously earlier when it's very famous, very famous for the crabs, uh, uh, and that's still very much a, an ongoing trade. But back in the uh, in the 19th century, uh, it was very famous for something called Solgum fruiters, and these were fruit um, sailing vessels, fruit schooners that imported in their heyday uh, up to 80% of citrus fruit and spices into England, and they served the, uh, the ports of London, Liverpool, Bristol, Cullen, and Southampton were their main ports. Uh, so these beautiful sailing vessels, they were all built here in Solcombe and some of the surrounding uh, areas, Kingsbridge, just up the estuary, uh, around the coast of Dartmouth as well, uh, crewed by local men. Uh, and famously, um, they quite often had uh, copper sheet hulls to aid their, aid their passage through the water, uh, a lot of sail for the size of vessel, uh, and they had to sail with their hatches open. Um, and this was to stop the fruit uh, from spoiling. And they carried um, citrus fruits from all over the Mediterranean, uh, and in their heyday, it was an amazingly strong um, orange trade from the Azores. Uh, and they all also carried um, the citrus fruits from, from Spain um, and, uh, and some ingredients from France. Um, and obviously, amongst those ingredients, they also carried casks of things like wine and sherry uh, back to England as well. And I'll get onto that uh, in a little bit later. One of the main ingredients, trading routes, was over to the Caribbean um, uh, using pineapples. And in their, uh, at that time, you know, pineapples were very much regarded as a luxury status symbol. Uh, in fact, in the top markets in London, they could fetch the equivalent of a thousand pounds in today's money uh, for the finest specimen. So um, we set out a start point, which is this beautiful citrus-led London dry gin. Um, we were quite amazed, um, uh, and we used a lot of the the citrus fruits and the spices from the same trading routes uh, that salt and fruiters uh, used to uh, import their goods from. So we looked through the cargo manifests uh, and, uh, and picked out these uh, such an amazing variety uh, of spices and, and citrus fruits. And that was a lot of the inspiration behind the flavor profile uh, of our gin. So I mentioned we took about 18 months to uh, develop the recipe, a lot of fun. Um, uh, we started out our uh, life with a, a little two and a half litre uh, copper still that uh, Jason will introduce you uh, to um, uh, a little bit later. Uh, and, and those are the same stills that we use today in our gin school uh, that will also be uh, popping over to in, uh, a little bit later in this episode. Um, we then uh, invested in a pair of 60 litre uh, Alembic copper stills, hand beaten copper stills, uh, that we used to run side by side uh, in parallel about 10 minutes apart. Uh, and so up to about a patch 40 of uh, start points was um, uh, created uh, by hand on these beautiful 60 litre uh, copper stills that we still have. Um, and we use them for really small uh, recipe development um, and also for our rum as well, which some of you may have um, heard about as well. So roll on kind of 18 months after we launched and we saw this, uh, obviously this trend for the pink uh, and, uh, and flavoured uh, gins. As, a, as a, a friend said, you know, pink isn't a flavour, uh, it, it's a colour. Um, and it didn't sit really particularly well with me because a lot of them were really sweet and, and, and not particularly um, pleasant, tend to be full of artificial colours and flavours and, and a load of sugar. Um, so we kind of decided not to pursue that and you know, another few months later we saw it as obviously a great opportunity and we had a lot of requests saying when are you going to bring out a pink gin? So we said, well, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it our way. Uh, and that is, uh, I love um, a glass of dry Provence Rosé. So that then became the inspiration for Rosé saint Marie um, gin. And so we thought, well, we don't need sugar, uh, because if you know what you're doing uh, with the distillation process, uh, you can use you know, carefully selected botanicals to effectively mimic uh, that, that sugar effect. Um, and we wanted something that was you know, fruity, um, still dry, uh, but soft and mellow and round around the edges. And obviously being inspired by, um, by a glass of Provence Rosé, I uh, started to use herbs that would typically grow uh, in, in Provence, Gary herbs as they're known, um, and things like lavender and uh, rose petals and, and also some strawberries, just to give that subtle uh, sweetness and a little uh, touch of colour. So, so I pulled this little um, sample so I don't know how many of you have got a, 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 a sample. I would always say to people, don't be afraid of, of trying gin neat. 
um, if it's a good gin and if it's really well crafted, um, you should be able to uh, enjoy it neat and nose it and sip it and even add a few drops of water to perhaps um, let it open up as you would uh, if you were if you were nosing and tasting uh, a whiskey. So the first thing I always do is look at the site as you swirl your uh, your liquid in the glass. Obviously, the Rosé Saint Marie here is is really subtle um, uh, in in terms of pink, and the, and the pink comes from just macerating. Um, with some strawberries for 24 hours uh, post distillation, uh, but not so much to give it an overpowering strawberry flavour, just to give it a little kind of subtle sweetness and hint of colour. Um, obviously, the downside we've had a few people say, well, I put it in the glass and make a gin and tonic and it's not pink anymore. Um, that's because it doesn't have anything artificial in it. Um, and if you leave it in the bottle in direct sunlight for long enough, uh, it will also fade to clear as anything would um, that's natural. But in the glass of a freshly opened bottle, you'll get a very subtle, uh, slight uh, pink tinge. And if you look it up to the light, you're looking for clarity. So some uh, spirits, um, see not many, come out the bottle um, cloudy. But if you add a few drops of water, there's a few people with cloudy um, gins on the market when you add um, drops of water. Uh, and that effect's known as luching. Um, and if, essentially it means, if, it, if it's unintended, uh, you've overcharged um, your still with too many botanicals for, for that batch and they're effectively dropping out, the essential oils are dropping out of suspension uh, as you, um, uh, when you add water. So for here I'm looking for perfect clarity, almost slight legs as I roll it around the glass so it mixes with oxygen and I want to take a really nice nose and, and for me I don't get any burn on this, uh, that's normally the sign of a good uh, of a good spirit as well if you don't get too much um, uh, burn and swirl it round and depending where you position on your nose a little bit to do in the camera here if you move it around your nose about an inch away from your nose different parts of your nostrils have different they're able to pick up slightly different aromas so what i'm getting here is something just soft i'm getting a bit of angelica um, definitely getting the strawberries on the nose and i'm also getting some slight kind of uh, lemony citrus notes that we're coming from the, the fresh lemon peel um, uh, and orange peels that we use in the distillation um, uh, and, and it's just it's kind of quite enticing um, and it makes you want to take a sip to what we're going to do now. Mm. Beautiful. So 41.4 percent, it's a little bit less than our start point gin, uh, but still really soft. Um, if, it, if this is the first drink, alcoholic drink you've had today, per spirit, um, I'd always say relax, then take another sip and then judge. Obviously, uh, quite a few of us in the business have to have to do a lot of tastings, um, which sometimes can get a little bit arduous. Most of the time, it's, it, it's pretty fun when you're tasting uh, new spirits you've created. Um, but you kind of roll that liquid around your mouth, and I definitely feel that it's almost like a creamy uh, and a soft uh, mouth feel that, that some look for. Now, depending on what botanicals you use in your gin, um, your um, uh, tongue, uh, different parts of your tongue will pick up different notes. So if it's, um, if it's a dry gin, you're using lots of roots, for example, Angelica and some Oris, um, the, the sensors at the back of your tongue will pick up a, a, a dry uh, gin, uh, depending on what that botanical bill is. If, it's, if you're getting a lot of sour notes on the tip of your tongue, then there tends to be more citrus uh, involved in the gin. But overall here, we've got something that's really nicely uh, balanced, uh, smooth, quite fragrant, um, and definitely our this gin as well as our start point as well. I always say the sign of a really good gin is being able to trap those volatile aromatics uh, in the glass. So what I always take great pride in is if you make gin and tonic uh, with with either our start point or Rosé Saint Marie, you come back to our gin 20 minutes later, you'll still know it's our gin that's in the glass. So we've just managed to trap those those aromatics. So I'll put that down the side and um, let's talk a little bit about perfect serve. So our start point gin, which many of you I'm sure have had, is classic citrus lead and we garnish simply with a slice of red grapefruit uh, and red grapefruit is the key kind of citrus we use in that. But for this, for Rosé Saint Marie, uh, inspired by obviously a glass of dry, dry Provence Rosé, so I actually prefer it in a wine glass. Um, and these are actually some, some glasses we do here. Um, and I think it's just kind of elegant uh, and balanced and better suited uh, for this drink. 
the sauce. So always take a suitable glass, so any wine glass, probably for this, if you're making gin and tonic, a large red wine glass uh, would work, and preferably one where the, the sides of the glass curve in, and that allows you to accentuate the aromas in the top of the glass. So when you're taking a sip, you get a really nice uh, aroma of the gin. So I'm just gonna add some ice to this. And I always say, don't skimp on ice. Um, the more ice you have in your glass, the colder it stays for longer, and actually the less dilution you have, uh, because the ice keeps the other feet of ice um, cold as well. Uh, and I just need my bottle, which I'll move over here. Uh, now, I'm, um, I'm very much a fan of, um, in fact, I only drink large measures, I'm afraid, because um, I think if you, if you want to taste gin, if you go to, um, if you go to a pub or a bar, and you order a single measure, and they, they then, you watch in horror as they pour an entire bottle of tonic, and then people complain, well, I can't really taste the gin. Well, that's because you've massively diluted it. You put 25 ml of spirit in, and then you add 200 ml of, uh, of tonic in, so it's no great surprise for our taste um, gin, particularly some tonic to really give strong flavor. So for this, I'm gonna take a, a, a jigger, lovely coffee jigger, and uh, I've got a speed pour on this bottle, it just makes it easier. And I will just literally pour myself a large measure, so that's 50 ml, into the glass. Quite often I'll put a little bit extra because it's what I call a founder's, founder's measure. And, uh, and then you want tonic. Now for this, I'm a big advocate of unflavoured tonic. Now I know all tonic has flavours in it, but uh, just a premium Indian tonic water. Um, completely preference here, whether you would like to use a light tonic, or, or what I call a full fat tonic, um, depending upon the level of sweetness. And this, to me, this, this gin specifically is about allowing you, uh, the gin consumer, to control the level of sweetness. If you want something slightly sweeter, uh, use um, a, a, a regular tonic. If you want something not as sweet, then use a light tonic. And then we'll also control it through the garnish we'll do in a minute. So I'm just gonna grab a bottle of tonic out of the fridge. So, in this case, I'm going for a full fat um, peanut tree tonic. Uh, and your ultimate ratio here is, um, is about three to one. Uh, some people like, like it a little bit more diluted, uh, but I kind of want to taste the gin uh, that's in it. So 50 ml measure, 150 ml tonic uh, into the glass. And there we go, there's my, my tonic. And uh, like any good bartender, I'll then just give that a Lovely little um, stir. Uh, if you haven't got one of these lovely uh, bar spoons, a uh, teaspoon, a spoon will do, or you don't even have to stir it, you can just swill it around in the glass. Um, other little bit of advice, so always keep your tonic in the fridge. Um, uh, if you just keep it on the shelf, um, you find in the fridge, um, it keeps its bubbles, it keeps the carbonation uh, for longer, So, and you want that lovely kind of carbonation um, in, your, in your glass. So, so, so there I have my, my gin and tonic. Now for garnish, um, you've got two choices here. Um, always try and garnish your gin, if you want to garnish in it, with something with one of the botanicals that's in uh, the spirit itself. So in this case, um, uh, strawberries uh, and lemon. Now, again, depending whether you want to go sweeter or drier, more citrusy, um, if you want to go sweeter, just use strawberries. And in this case, I will use uh, sliced strawberries. We'll just take a, a fresh strawberry uh, here, and I will simply place that in the glass. Uh, just that's one strawberry from the three three slices. Um, I actually really like the combination of the strawberry and the lemon. Um, so I would take a fresh fresh lemon uh, and just peel a bit of the uh, of the rind off here. Um, here's one I've got uh, And when you've got the pith, the pith can be quite bitter. So if you use a vegetable peeler or take a knife, and then if you then take the I'll just get my chopping board up here on the surface here to show you. So if you then take a knife here, and, this, it, and you'll actually find if you use a, a sharp knife, take a slice of peel there, you can see, hopefully you can see, there's still quite a bit of pit there. And that can be quite bitter. And for exactly the same reason that when we're distilling, when we're peeling our fresh citrus fruits, um, we don't want the pit. We just want the skin, and it's the skin that contains the essential oils that give our, our, our gin such a bright citrus flavour. 
So for this here, I'll get a little bit fancy and just trim, trim our, uh, my garnish. Um, so I've got a nice little bit of ribbon, just like that. And then I will just twist it, squeeze it over the glass, and just get those essential oils. I can smell them coming out of the air here now. Uh, give that another little quick stir. So I've got strawberries and uh, lemon peel. As again, entirely personal choice. I think this is really well balanced. Uh, and um, cheers. That is a uh, salt and rosy. Cheers. And tonic. Cheers, Angus. That was amazing. And I love your eye, eye for detail. You can see that perfectionist um streak in you just coming through it's amazing and everything that you do it's absolutely attention to detail which actually shines through in your um in your gin one uh, we're running slightly over time but one very very quick question before we go and make our first cocktail with richard what would you suggest and I know, this is a question from what one of um one of our guests what would you suggest a snack or a food pairing to be with this because you're you're saying that this is you know the inspiration is Provence and rosé etc. Would you would you actually have this with with any food? Um, it, to me, this is the uh, you know a perfect aperitif. Um, mm. So like with e with either our gins actually only our gins, I really love it with some fresh seafood. So I I would mm. definitely go for a, a lovely bit of a, a crab salad, uh, a crab bonbons, get something something with fish. Um, you know, we're here in a beautiful part of the world on the coast. But everything we do about our gins is kind of transporting people back to that special place. So we want the people to close their eyes, and particularly now, you know, in, 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 in the lockdown we've just had, of, uh, you know, take you to your, your, special, your special place. Uh, in fact, you had a fantastic holiday in the Mediterranean uh, last summer, and you booked this year and you can't go there. Well, hopefully this gives a little bit of, brings a little bit of Mediterranean sunshine uh, back into your life. Yeah, that's... That's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And I think all good, all good drinks should have that kind of occasion and have that memory um, for you. If you if you got the right right gin, I'm sure it's all do that. Anyway, thanks so much, Angus. We'll be back to yeah, you, you soon. Uh, and now we are going to um, Richard in London um, by the magic of uh, Zoom. Hope yes, fantastic. Here we are. So Richard is going to take us through um, our first cocktail. But first, Richard, could you just um, do a quick intro introduction to yourself and your background, what you do for, um, what's your relationship with Salkum? Would that be? Um... Yeah, of course. I, I just had to, sorry if I just limped forward there. It said that I needed to unmute. So can you, can you guys yeah. hear me? Absolutely. You're, you're, yeah. It's all, all loud, loud, loud and clear, loud, loud and clear. Happy days. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my living room. Uh, obviously, we're in lockdown still here in London. So, um, yeah, I'm in my living room here and I'm sitting down on a stool. So this is going to be the first time I've made a cocktail when sitting down. So wish me luck with that. And um, it shouldn't be any different, but who knows? You know, life's a mystery and all of that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so hello, I'm Richard. And as well as being brand ambassador up here in London for Glorious Salcombe Gin, I also run a cocktail events company. Uh, and cons uh, consultancy company called Mix and Muddle. Um, if you want to check us out online, um, we mainly do events for marketing PR companies, but then we we uh, we also do virtual masterclasses, things like this. Uh, yeah, a whole load of stuff. Obviously, at the moment, it's slightly different because events pretty much aren't happening uh, probably until the end of the year. So we're starting to do delivered cocktail boxes and things like that. Um, but yeah, primarily uh, I'm working with Salt and Gin, been working for about two years now, I think it was. Uh, just, uh, I also used to teach sailing, so I've got a very close connection to this brand and I, uh, I kind of think it's a little bit of fate uh, that I am, and I am now working for them. Um, I, I used to go down to Salt and quite a lot, I used to sail a lot. Uh, and I remember going to Salt once and seeing the distillery being built and going, that's a very clever idea because Salkham has all of these luxury brands like Jack, well, Jack Wills and some clothing brands, uh, and obviously their crab and their fish, but they needed something else consumable and gin made absolute sense. At the end of the day, sailing is just religion almost that you have uh, a g and So I then tried the spirits, the start point obviously, which is their first gin and fell in love with it. I fell in love with the brand uh, and the rest is history, I suppose though. Um, yeah. so, I'm actually going to make two cocktails 
for you today. The first one that I'm going to make, make for you now, both of them are with Rosé Saint-Marie, obviously. Um, and both of these cocktails are uh, harking to your happy place, ultimately. They are inspired by the Mediterranean, obviously, because Saint-Marie is also inspired by the Mediterranean. But for me, these are two drinks which uh, I like to have when I'm in my happy place, which, surprise, surprise, this is not cheesy. I absolutely promise you, it genuinely is Solcum. I described to my girlfriend, who's literally in the next room, and to uh, many other people that my happy place is Solcum uh, because I am a geek. And it is a very beautiful place. Uh, so, I'm going to make this uh, first cocktail for, for you called a rose cooler. Now, obviously, Samari is inspired by Provence rose wine. So, I decided to go one step further and actually put rose wine in the drink itself. Um, the rose wine that I'm using is a Provence rose. Uh, I think with a standard, uh, with a really classic Provence rose, it matches the flavors in the gin. It's crisp, uh, it's quite subtle, uh, it's light, uh, it's got very subtle red fruits in the background. It's not too cloying, it's not too sweet, uh, it's quite dry, so actually works really, really well uh, in this drink. So, without further ado, let's make a cocktail. So I've got my shaker. I'm going to be shaking this one. Uh, if you don't have a shaker, by the way, you could use a reusable coffee cup. If it has a really strong lid, uh, you could use a jam jar. Uh, you could use a kiln jar if you've got one of those. Uh, basically anything with a really steady lid that you can then strain out of. So I'm going to start off with Saint-Marie, obviously. Uh, I'm going to put into my shaker, for those of you who are following along, 35 milliliters. Now, I like to convert this into tablespoons for people. That is about four tablespoons, if you haven't got one of these fancy copper jigger things. So 35 mils is going to go into my shaker. Glorious stuff. Now I'm going to go to my rosé wine. As I said, Provence, uh, Provence rosé, it's really light in colour. Um, it's very crisp. I'm going to put 50 mils, so a double shot, about six tablespoons of that straight into my shaker. Then I've got some freshly squeezed lemon joy, uh, lemon joice, that's not a word, lemon <laughs> juice is more likely to be a word. Um, so I'm going to put uh, 10 mils of that, that is about two teaspoons. There we go. Marvelous. And then my final ingredient is a homemade syrup. Now I think people can be quite scared of making syrups because they think they might get it wrong. One of the biggest things that we waste in our kitchens are I think everybody buys a big bag of herbs, to, or they grow the rope, which is even better, but they buy a big bag of herbs, they use a couple, and then it goes off and they chuck it away. So what mm. I like to do is make syrups from my leftover herbs, because then it'll last loads longer, and you get a really fragrant, really delicious syrup. This one is with lemon thyme. Now, lemon thyme, fortunately enough, surprisingly enough, is in the gin, uh, is in San Marie. And what I've done is I've combined one cup of sugar one cup of boiling water in a saucepan. I've put in some lemon thyme, about two or three sprigs, sprigs, given it a little crush, um, and then I've combined it so it dilutes, and then leave it for about 15 minutes. It'll cool down, you can strain off your lemon thyme, you can chill the syrup, and it'll last, well, indefinitely, but if it does still have some lemon thyme in there, I'd say about a month, I'd give it about a month. And you can enhance your gin and tonics with these syrups, uh, you can use them for any cocktails if you like, particular, like a gin sour would work beautifully with Saint Marie. Um, you could use this as your syrup instead of just a regular sugar syrup. So, again, 10 mils uh, of this bad boy, which uh, is about two teaspoons. I'm just using a, sh a shot glass at, at home, Richard. Is that all right? Like, just as a kind of a measure, you can do that, can't you? Yeah, sure. Well, if you've got, so if you've got a double shot glass, obviously, which would be 50 mils, and then a single shot glass, yeah. would be five. Yeah, you can just, I mean, to be honest with these, use your common sense a little bit. Um, use your own judgment. If you like your cocktails a little bit sweeter, feel free to put a little bit more syrup in. Mm. If you like a bit tartar, put a bit more lemon in. Um, yeah, it's, it's always, we always say that if you are making a, a cocktail, you just need to, keep on tasting it don't you and everybody's palate's different and even the lemons which you're using can some can be tarter than others so you need to kind of adjust it don't you just just to to make sure that it's to your palate 
Yeah, exactly. And everybody, especially when it comes to cocktails, everybody has their preference of what they like and what they don't like. So yeah, it's trial and error. If you are making this for a group of people, make it beforehand, give it a go, see if it works for you. If it doesn't, try another recipe. Um, when I'm developing recipes for Mixed Muddle and for Solcum, I do it about three or four times just in order to find the right balance for what I'm looking for. But you, you are right, the lemon will give a, a slightly different flavor. Uh, the syrup, you might put a bit more sugar in when you were making it, so it might be thicker, so like sweeter. So yeah, you just wanna find your own balance when we're doing it. Uh, okay, so the next thing I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna put ice in my glass. This is gonna be in a classic highball. Um, I've got one of these beautiful lunar highballs here, which is slightly rounded. Um, I'm gonna fill, fill it with ice. Uh, excuse fingers. If I was in a bar, I wouldn't normally be touching this ice. Obviously, no one's going to be doing that now after uh, when the bars reopen. I hope um, you use uh, hand sanitizer. Yeah, exactly. I have washed my hands before I do this, but also it's only me touching it. So, exactly, <laughs> I'm not going to leave this, this flat uh, for the rest of the evening. Um, then I'm going to fill my half of the shaker that I put my ingredients in with ice. Right, so ice is your friend, as Angus, I think, mentioned. Never skimp out on ice. Um, when you are shaking a cocktail, you want as much ice in there so it can chill and it can move around as much as possible. Uh, you really don't want to uh, skimp out on ice. The same as when you're filling your glass, fill it right to the top with ice. Um, ice is your friend. That is a motto which I'm now going to adopt. Um, okay, so I'm going to give it a shake. So you want to shake this for about five to, five to ten seconds. You've got a good shake going on there, Richard. That's a good shake. Thanks. I literally, uh, someone once told me that I have um, a Japanese shake and I, I've got zero idea what that means. Um, I've never heard of that and I've been behind no, bars it's, it's most of my life. Tell me that. <laughs> oh, I can see people's shakes. Yeah, you can see it, that people get shaking. Oh, that's There's brilliant. There's a lot of shaking going on. And to be honest, Richard, this is probably our our biggest shake so far with the reach for around the world. We've got people in New Zealand going on. We've got people in Texas, California. Oh, yeah, we, we, we've just, we've, we've uh, instigated a world shake. <laughs> wow, we should really do like a shake off for NHS or something like that. Yeah, exactly, shake, no, shake this for should be a good idea. Um, okay, Shake for so, carers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Someone's, we need a PR company to come up with a tagline for that. So I'm going to then strain, uh, keep shaking it for still going. I'm going to strain my cocktail. I've got a fine strainer, a little sieve here. But if you haven't got a cocktail shaker, uh, you can just pour it through a regular sieve. Um, I've got two, I've got one strain on top and then a fine one because I don't want any ice particles going in. Oh yeah, there it is. So I'm probably- We've got some professionals here, Richard. We've got some professionals, you know? I can see okay. people with copper shakers and everything. Yes. Got better shakers than me. No slouches on here, I can tell you. No messing about. I like it. I like your style, guys. Um, right, so I've left about an inch at the top. By the way, if you can't see, it's got this really beautiful rosé hue to it from the wine and from the gin. Um, and then I'm going to top this with some light tonic water. I don't want to overpower this. It's got enough sugar, I think, from the lemon thyme syrup. Um, so I just want to add a little bit of fizz, a little bit of spritz. So I'm going to pour some light tonic over the top, right to the brim. And then finally, I'm going to give it a very gentle stir. You don't want to ruin the bubbles too much. So just to the bottom and then draw your spoon back up. Now to garnish this bad boy, my rosé cooler, I've got a nice sprig here of lemon thyme. Uh, what else we work in this? If you've got some lemon, just a bit of lemon peel or a lemon uh, wedge, but I love this lemon thyme. And because I'm mm. a geek, I've also got a tiny little mini peg uh, because I like miniature things. And uh, I think it looks beautiful when I just attach this sprig to the edge of the glass like so. So then when I'm drinking, I can get all that lemon thyme aroma up my nose. So everybody, if you're, if you're quite ready to drink, cheers. Cheers, Richard. That looks amazing. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I think that lemon and thyme yes. are just such a beautiful combination, aren't they? Lemon thyme is beautiful because what well, thyme is incredibly fragrant, obviously. Lemon thyme is a bit softer, and I think it has like lovely notes of lemon sherbet. 
and uh, and dried lemon peel. It's really, really beautiful lemon time. Mm. I love working with it. Cheers. Some people Cheers. have got some glorious glassware, by the way. As I say, there are no slouches on, on here. There are lots of um, very serious people with their glassware and their, and their cocktail shakers and all sorts. It's, it's great. It's great to see. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Richard. We will be back to you um, yep. fairly soon. But we're cool. going back to sunny or maybe slightly um, rainy Devon to uh, Jason. <laughs> who is going to take us through uh, a bit more detail about the still and about how Sorkum make their gins and what makes Sorkum so special, well, Sorkum gin so special, their techniques. So I, without further ado, we shall go with the wonders of modern science to Jason. And there you are, standing in front of his, uh, his stills. Over to you, Jason. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me clearly. I've just unmuted. I think you can hear me now. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. 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 yeah, excellent. My name is Jason Nichols. I'm the um, master distiller here at Sotton Distilling Company. And I'm stood in front of our still here product. Uh, this is a 450 litre still. And this is the still on which we make all of our Sotton gins. Um, we do the run rate on our still, but anything, any gin that you buy from Sockham uh, is made on this one here. So what I'm going to do is talk you through um, a little bit of the, the technical stuff uh, around how distillation works, because that's a very good way of explaining how um, the, we, we make the most of the ingredients that we use in, in, our, in our gin making. Um, so I'll start off with a few, few little technical bits first. Um, this is a, the plot of the still here. This, this, uh, this door opens up, and this is how we put all of the ingredients in. Um, we, uh, we use um, what's called the one shot method of gin making, which is part of the London Dry Gin Making Standard. We'll touch on a little bit more of that in, in a few minutes. Um, but what we have to do to start with, first thing in the morning, this is a day long process to still here, um, is charge the still. Um, and the, the bulk of the, uh, the uh, the, the ingredients that go in here is, is liquid, and that liquid is, is water, and it's a, a very high strength uh, grain spirit. Uh, effectively, it's a very high strength water, that's what, that's what we use to make the gin. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is blended with water when we, when we boil it up uh, to, a, to a strength of about 50% alcohol. Um, the um, ingredients. Um, Going the still there. There's also a couple of other things we add later on into the uh, infusion basket, which I'll touch upon for some of our gins. But the idea is um, we, we shut this door and we kick off the heat. Underneath here is a big um, electrically heated water bath, and that slowly heats up the uh, liquid inside and the ingredients and, and brings them up to the, to the boil. Um, and this is when the process of distillation kicks in. When we talk about distillation, all we're talking about is this endeavour to separate two liquids with different boiling points. Because we've got water in there that boils at 100 degrees, we've got uh, if you can hear me now. Um, when um, uh, when this uh, the mixture in here starts to boil, the boiling point is this combined mixture of alcohol and water is only 82 degrees. Uh, so we, it's a lovely big uh, bubbly mess in there, we can see it through the window when it happens, um, but it's only boiling at 82 degrees. And so we're nowhere near the boiling point of water. The vapour that comes off is a mixture of alcohol and water and all of the flavours that have been infused into that liquid, they come through as well. Um, but when the vapour, the steam comes off the top, um, uh, because we're nowhere near the boiling point of water, but as soon as it hits a surface that is less than 100 degrees, uh, the water component uh, starts to condense and it runs down inside the still uh, and it leaves the alcohol uh, and the, the, the flavours that are carried with it in, 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 a, in a much greater strength. And that's the whole, uh, the whole of this apparatus here, or this distilling apparatus, is all about concentrating the alcohol and removing as much of the water as we can. And the reason for that is that the flavours are carried with the alcohol and that's why we want to make sure that the gin, when it comes out this end, is as strong as we can get it. 
So it, it's, a, it's a very simple process. The, uh, the, the, the vapor uh, finds its way out through these pipes. It travels through an infusion um, basket in the back here. Uh, and this is a very good way of, of, of handling very uh, subtle flavor ingredients. In the case of our rose saint marie, we put um, uh, lavender flowers and rose pickings in there. Uh, and the hot vapor as it travels through, picks up the flavor and the aroma, but you're not breaking down the, the, um, the petals and the flowers uh, as would happen if they were poured more harshly down here in the still. So what we're doing is we're extracting the, 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 the subtle flavors, but we're not getting any kind of broken down, down vegetable flavors that may happen if they, if they were poured more harshly. Um, vapor travels into the bottom of this, uh, this column in the middle. And again, this is the, the column in the middle here is another means of concentrating the alcohol and the flavors. And it does that because there's a series of copper plates that uh, sit behind these windows. And as we get further away from the heat source, they're progressively cooler. So once again, there's more water condensing and runs down inside the still. Um, I think the still is connecting like just here. So that the vapor that comes out of the top uh, is, is again more, more concentrated. Vapor finds its way into this uh, column here, this stainless steel one, and this is where we're using cooling water, which is just a few cold water in the bottom. Uh, the, the pipes in the middle are cooled, and whatever's, whatever's still in vapor form is now condensed, and it runs out the, the bottom here, this, this parrot spout, uh, as our gin. Um, now, at this point, the, the, the strength of, of, of our gin uh, is, a, is, on average, throughout the day, about 86% alcohol. Um, you can't drink it at that strength. Um, it's, um, it's not very pleasant, to be honest. It burns the throat, it makes your eyes water, pops, it makes your ears pop. Um, but if you dip your finger under, just have a trip on your tongue, um, you get the flavour of the aroma, uh, but the, the, the alcohol is evaporated by the time it gets back in your mouth. So, um, we do have quite a bit, that's how we, that's how we taste that gin as, this, as the process goes on. And this is the one, one of the most interesting parts of, of gin making, because at no point could you say that this is the finished product until it's blended together in the tanks at the bottom here. Um, and the reason for that is because um, the, uh, the, the, the flavour profile of this changes constantly. Uh, it's almost like a rainbow of flavours. If we think back to the flavours that the ingredients that we've added in here, with our start point gin, we talk about it being a citrus led flavour. So we have three citrus fruits going there, and if they're freshly peeled, they're, it's just the zest, the outside of the fruit. Um, freshly peeled on the morning of distillation with our rose samari, uh, it's oranges and lemons. Um, but what happens is that those quite volatile um, aromas are the first to be released when the mixture starts to boil. So to start with, the flavour that comes through here is very dominantly citrusy. Um, once the citrus starts to fade away, we tend to get um, the, the more the brighter floral aromas um, and then the warmer spices. And as the day goes on, um, and most of the ingredients have released their flavours, what comes through here is, is tends to be a bit more dry, earthy, woody, depending on the ingredients that you, you've used. So what we have to do is manage this flow of gin to make sure that we capture the flavours that we want uh, and then we discard some of the flavours that we don't want. And that involves making a couple of cuts in this run. Two cuts that divide it into three sections, which are called the heads, the hearts and the tails. Now the heads, um, is only the very first part of um, the, the, the run. Uh, it's only the first couple of litres normally. Um, it varies depending on what type of gin we're making. But I've already said that the, uh, the citrus flavours are the first ones to come through. And in fact, the very first part is, is almost too strongly citrus. It's often um, very, very lemony. It's more, a, little, a little bit more um, fly spray or detergent than gin. So we want to, to get rid of that. And that also helps with um, one of the challenges that Gus mentioned earlier, which is Lucian. Um, a concentration of certain types of flavours that, that might make your gin go a bit cloudy. So we take, um, take off the, the first part of the run, then we get into the hearts, and the hearts is the gin that we want to keep, and that's the bulk of, of, of what we're distilling here, so um, normally that's a couple of hundred litres on this still. But because the things are changing constantly, there comes a time later in the day when we have to make a judgment call, um, and it's, uh, this is very much a, a manual process. It looks quite big and complicated, but there's a lot of manual involvement here. 
a judgment call based on um, uh, temperatures, um, alcoholic strength, and the flavor and the volume. When we make a decision to cut to tails um, and we'll stop collecting gin because the flavor has gone a little bit, uh, a little bit too far. Um, and what happens is we'll, we'll, we'll gather the tails in um, a separate tank and the tails becomes, some of the tails becomes an ingredient of the next day's still run. So um, we start the still, we'll put some of the tails from the day before. And the flavors that are already in solution there, some of the ones that we want to keep, they will come through um, a little bit sooner in the run. Um, and we will we'll gather those in the main body of gin. What happens um, towards, the, towards the end is that most of the alcohol that has been boiling through all day has disappeared and what's left in the still is mainly water. So towards the end, this becomes quite watery as well. Um, and that's another reason for, for, for cutting the tails so we're not diluting the stronger flavors that we collected earlier. Um, so that is the, that is the, the, the gin making process. It, it, it's very simple, um, but uh, because of the way distillation works, because of the way alcohol and water boil at different temperatures and all the big flavors that are associated with gin boil at slightly different temp temperatures as well, um, we, we capture some things in our gin, but other things always remain in the still. Quite commonly, um, uh, or, or, or common ingredients that, that do that are sugar and salt. So if you're distilling with something salty or you're distilling with something that's sweet, the sugar will remain in the still. It just doesn't boil at these kind of temperatures, so it never ever finds its way from here. So if you want a gin that is um, that has an element of sweetness to it, uh, and you could say our rosé saint marie has has a little bit of that um, when compared to some drier gins. Um, what you have to do is manage that sweetness. Well, there's two ways to do it. One is um, uh, to add lots of sugar afterwards, which, which uh, some gin makers might do. Um, we're not keen on adding too much sugar, um, so we, we've never added sugar to any of our gins. Um, what we do is we choose, we choose a range of ingredients that trick your mind into, into thinking and associating um, that gin with, with sweetness. So, of course, in the rosé gin, we have uh, lots of strawberries. There's a lot of fresh strawberries going to the still here to start with. Um, and whilst the sugar content of those strawberries won't be still through, um, the, the flavoured strawberry does, and that's something that helps to trigger that sweetness in your, in your mind. Uh, likewise, a little bit of licorice, currants, rose petals, um, all of those things have uh, uh, are associated with sweetness, and, and, and that's one of the ways you, you construct your gin flavour. Um, so, yeah, back to the gin that, that comes out here, 86% um, on average, so it, it's too strong to drink. After that time, um, it's uh, it, it blended down with, with water. Um, when it comes to water that we use when we're distilling, we're very lucky in this part of the world in that the water that we use when we're distilling, the water that goes in here at the start, um, we don't have to treat that at all, that can be just tap water because our water comes from Dartmoor, it's very smooth, the mineral content is such that it's not going to interfere with, with the distilling process. Um, if we're in other areas of the country, we might, we might have to treat our water before we use it, we're lucky. Um, the, the water that's used for blending, however, is uh, manipulated. We manage the mineral content there with purification um, in order to um, not add anything to our gene. Um, that is going to cause any problems with, uh, with uh, potentially cloudiness or even just the flavour. Um, you can't just distill, uh, you can't just blend your gin with tap water, mineral water, spring water without treating it first for, for that reason. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, um, the, the, the gin making process. And as I said, all of the gins that we make here are made on the still. Um, Stark Point Gin and the Rosé Saint Marie are our, our biggest and uh, most popular ones. We do have a range of uh, um, limited edition gins that we do, we call it, we call it the Voyager series. Um, most of these have been made in conjunction with Michelin star chefs. We have Michael Haynes from Exeter, and Mark Hicks from Lime Reads in London. Uh, and one that we uh, did, did um, latterly and still have on the go is Island Queen, um, which was made with uh, uh, Monica Galetti, uh, judge from MasterChef, who came down here to gin school. And with her, we formulated a recipe that had she wants some tropical flavours, and um, so we end up with something with, with lots of steep pineapple. Um, Jason, um, Jason, we're, we're just running a bit over time now. Um, do, 
can we get back to those gins in the Q&A and go through those course, a little bit yeah, later? Is that we'll okay? Later on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, thanks so much for that. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, I've got loads of questions for you. We're, I won't okay. go into those now. I'll go into those um, once we're back in um, in the gin school and relaxing over a, 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 um, a sulcum and tonic, if that's okay, okay with you. Great. But we'll, 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 we, we need to batter on to uh, batter back to um, Richard and uh, have our second um, cocktail. But thanks so much. Okay. Right. It's back to London, back to Richard, back to his living room, and hopefully you'll have all enjoyed the first cocktail which he, he um, made for us. Well, you probably made it for yourself, but the one which he uh, illustrated to us. Now it's time for our second cocktail. So hopefully, with the wonders of modern science, we are going to Richard. Richard, can Hello. you hear us? Fantastic. I can hear you. Can that you hear was me? absolutely seamless, wasn't it? Seamless. It really was Fantastic. beautiful. You know, I feel like I'm in a Eurovision Song Contest and you're coming over to me and I'm representing a country and I'm giving the scores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so it's the UK, it's Neil Poin, isn't it? <laughs> it's always Neil Poin. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Not on this occasion. Um, anyway, so yes, the second cocktail that I'm going to make for you um, is a very simple cocktail. Again, I wanted both of these cocktails to be something easy you can make at home. Um, and really showcase Rosé Saint-Marie, uh, funnily enough. So this one uh, is going to be made in this beautiful wine glass here, uh, and it's called Ciao Bella. So this has got a slight um, nod to Italy. Uh, it is still very Mediterranean, it's still very light, uh, and it still celebrates Rosé Saint-Marie. So it's built, nothing is shaken in this cocktail, so you can put your shaker to one side. Um, you're just going to need your ice, your glass, and your ingredients. So I'm going to start by filling my uh, wine glass here with ice. So I've got a nice big block there, and then I'm going to add some cubes on top of that. Yet again, ice is your friend, as it always is in life. Okay, so my, my glass is full of ice. Um, first ingredient that I'm going to add, everything's going to be built, as I said, is Rosé Saint-Marie. So this time, I'm going to use 25 ml, one shot, uh, and that is about, well, hang on, let me work it out, about three, three tablespoons if you've only got that. So, 25 ml, just poured straight over the ice. Marvellous stuff. A little bit spilt there, so I'm just going to, for good measure, put a little bit more in because we're all at home and we're all adults. Next, I'm going to add uh, some rose vermouth. So, before we used rose wine, uh, which is ultimately a young, uh, unfortified vermouth, because uh, vermouth is, is, is wine-based. So I'm using uh, Belsazar, but that's not because I could, that's all I could get. Um, there are, there's a beautiful vermouth down in Devon called Night Or Vermouth. Uh, there's a beautiful vermouth up here in London called Londinio. But there are some fantastic brands out there as well, very readily available, like Regal Rogue. Um, they've, got a, they've got a superb uh, rosé vermouth. I think rosé vermouth is absolutely delicious, by the way. If you do want to get into vermouth a little bit more and explore that area, try out rosé vermouth next time you're making a cocktail, next time you're making a martini. For example, it's not this cocktail. If you want to make a rosé saint-marie martini, rosé saint-marie and rosé vermouth is spot on. It's bang on the nose. So this one, though, we're going to do 25 mils again. So that's the same measure. In it goes. Now, I said this was a nod to Italy, and I was correct. Next ingredient is lemoncello. Lemoncello, yet again, a very unused ingredient in the bar world, I think. It's used in all the Italian restaurants after you finish your meal, but I think it's beautiful in cocktails. So it's quite yeah. powerful. Uh, there are many, many brands out there you could use. Um, it's quite powerful to cure, so we're going to use 15 mils of this. Pour that over the top. Like so. And then, it's very simple, we're going to top it. So, it's a Mediterranean cocktail, so it makes sense that we use something hard to that. We, I'm going to use Beaver Tree's Mediterranean tonic on this occasion. And now, here's a little tip when you're pouring tonic over ice. 
If you pour it from quite a height straight over the ice, it'll kill a lot of the bubbles. What I do is I take the glass, I pour it to the side, and I try and pour it down the side of the glass. That way, you're going to keep as many of those bubbles as possible. So there we go. Pretty much right to the top, leave a centimetre or so. And now you want to give that a little stir. So very gently, again, you don't want to kill these bubbles. Spoon down the side of the glass, give it a tiny spin and then pull it upwards. That's it. Delicious. Now, to garnish this, uh, there's a lot of orange peel in San Marie. So, first and foremost, I'm going to put a nice big slice of orange, if I can get it in. I've got a very wobbly, uh, hang on a minute, I'll get that. There it is. Right down the side, like so. And then, for a little bit of freshness, a little bit of aromat, I'm going to add some, a nice big sprint, uh, sprig of mint. Give it a little spine, fine slap. And then stick it down the side. And just pop it in the top there, like so. That's and it. Why, why do you give it a slap, Richard? So if you give it a slap, there are little pores on the surface of the, the mint. And if you give it a slap, they open up and it releases uh, some of those mint aromas and the mint oils. So if you give it a little slap, it'll, as you go to drink it, you'll probably notice. Put your nose close. Well, if it's in a wine glass, it will be close. Uh, you can get a big smell, a big whack of that mint aroma. Oh. oh, that's gorgeous. Hallelujah. Cheers, guys. That's delicious. Cheers, cheers, cheers. That is absolutely stunning, Rich. So, guys, if you're looking for a spritzer for, a, for the summer, in my, my idea, this, is, this has got it in the bag. Yeah. See you guys later. I'm off. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's really great. <laughs> that, that's a, a, an absolute showstopper, that one. Um, yeah beautiful balance to it and I, think it, I it love I love the, the, the rosé cooler we did was was a, a lot lighter and quite not, not quite as sweet this is a little bit sweeter but the lemoncello adds a nice bit of tartness in there uh, and then the tonic obviously adds a bit of bitterness but it's got a lot it's got a lot of body to it it's got a lot of uh, weight to it it's still delicate I think it's delicious brilliant well cheers everybody fantastic thank you so much Richard please stay on um, yes uh, please stay on because we'll come back you know Q&A time is really fun time where we can all relax there'll be loads of questions no doubt for you um, probably you and I will stay up till about half 11 or something drinking but you know that's <laughs> that, that's just par for the course with this with this is what we do so don't thank you so that. so so between what's you. that don't tell them that it's between me and you <laughs> <laughs> yeah fantastic well, um, thanks again. We have now got to dash back to Devon, where we're going to see a little bit of behind the scenes of what happens in the distillery with their gin school and their um, maturation process. So I do believe, with the magic of science, we are going to go to see Jason in the gin school. Fantastic. Here, Jason, yep. over By to you. Well, the magic of science, we are now in the gin school. Um, uh, the, the distillery room is actually in another building that is behind the previous two windows. So I'm only 20 yards away, but I've been downstairs and upstairs to get here into the gin school. Um, I don't know how much people know about this, whether they've seen this on our website or been here in person to, uh, to make their own bottle of gin. But uh, we work in here on uh, stills like this one which are called two and a half litre stills, but in fact they make just over a bottle at a time. Um, and the idea is people come here uh, for a three hour course during which they get a bit of tuition on distilling. Um, they choose their own ingredients. We have eight, 80 odd uh, different botanicals uh, to choose from. So no two gins are ever the same. And we've actually, in the three years since we've been doing this, we, we've actually had 7,000 people through here and made 4,000 bottles of gin. Um, so it's been amazingly successful. We won loads of awards. We, we were the um, uh, Cookery School of the Year in Devon was the first one I think we had, and and, and latterly um, the Southwest Tourism uh, Small uh, Visitor Attraction of the Year. Uh, so we we won some amazing awards. We get some incredible feedback, uh, but unfortunately at the moment, uh, due to social distancing measures, we, uh, we we can't do what we like to do in here. Um, which is classes of uh, 16 people working on 10 stills. Uh, it's all a bit too close to comfort. 
uh, but we have been doing a few um, virtual uh, online gym schools, so not dissimilar to this format where um, families come online from disparate locations in the world uh, and collectively they uh, instruct us on how to make their bottle of gin. So we give them a bit of encouragement and advice and they choose the ingredients and then we distill uh, a bottle of gin for them on this still here. Um, so they can go through um, most of the experience and most of the learning process. Um, uh, and we've done a few of those and they've been pretty successful actually. It's, it's quite good fun, although we do miss seeing people in person here. Uh, and one day soon we'll get back to it, hopefully. Um, in the meantime, the other thing that we do in here, this, this is also uh, as an area off to my um, left here. This is our um, research and development laboratory as well. And this is how we develop our new gins. So we go through this process of, um, of various iterations of, of, uh, of flavours and tweaking them as we go and uh, until uh, everybody's happy. Um, sometimes it gets a little bit more scientific than that, but uh, uh, that's, the, that, that's the gist of it. Um, and once we're happy with the recipe on still this size, um, then we go through processes of scaling it upwards to um, bigger production, probably on the, uh, on the still we saw earlier on. And how, so, Jason, how, how difficult is it to scale up something which you come up with on one of those little stills into that mammoth thing which we saw you in front of um, earlier? Yeah. Is, is it difficult or is it just um, a matter of getting the say, calculator out? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's difficult for us now. Um, we, we had some advice when we first did it. Um, it's, it's not as, just as simple as, as scaling up the ingredients pro rata. Uh, the, the other still you saw earlier makes 600 bottles in one go, and this obviously makes one. It's not just as simple as multiplying by 600, um, yeah. because the, the main difference is the, is the boiling time. This will produce a perfectly brilliant bottle of gin. It's not, this isn't amateur equipment, it, 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 it does a perfect job. Um, but um, the, the, so the main difference is not one quality, it's the length of time in, that your ingredients are boiling for, which on here is about half an hour. And on there it's six hours mm. so some of the ingredients you reduce the quantities um, and we've got enough um, uh, experience now to know roughly what we should be doing when we do scale up um, because they've obviously got a lot longer to release their flavors and, and for, for a longer period they will re release some different flavors as well yeah brilliant um, so uh, when do you think the gin school will be back in action well, we're making, um, we're, we're sort of pinning our hopes on, on sometime in September, but really everything is, is quite up in the air. I mean, there's, there's two factors. Um, one is the, um, um, you know, the, the rules and regulations around social distancing. And the other one is, is the fun aspect. You know, we could get people up here, we could sit them apart, um, we can um, take all those measures to, to make it possible. But actually one of the great things about coming to gin school is you meet people, you get chatting to the people that are next door, you try their gin, they try yours. Uh, and a lot of that stuff really wouldn't be possible. So we, we're actually not going to rush back into it because um, we, um, we want it to be the best experience possible. Um, so we, we think September might be the, uh, the best option. And in the meantime, um, we're doing a few online um, uh, sessions. Uh, and, and, and gradually rolling people over so that um, they can, um, if, if they're already booked or if they already have vouchers, they, they can use those um, later in the year or next year. So you've got a, like a virtual gin school, right? That's right, yeah. You, you, can, you can find it on our website, but it, it, the, um, the, the gist of it is that um, as, a, as a family or a group of friends that maybe can't get together um, because of the situation at the moment, um, if you all log into to Zoom or, um, or Google, we can um, effectively have a, a, a remote gin school. Uh, everybody participates as, as little as much as they want, and then we'll make one bottle on here, and then we duplicate it afterwards and send each of those participants a, a bottle of their own. So nobody misses out, um, and it's a, you know, it's a fun collaborative uh, uh, exercise. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, um, I think now we've got to go down to see Angus in front of the casks, I do believe. So um, without further ado, we'll go from the gin school 
down to see Angus and he's going to explain to us about some of the really special uh, stuff which they're doing um, and all of the really exclusive um, additions which are coming up. So hopefully um, his phone is going to be working in the uh, warehouse side of things. Um, is he there? Have we found him? Or has he disappeared into the uh, Devon mist somewhere? Hopefully he's there. Um, I'm not actually controlling this, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll find him. Oh, there he is, I think. That's, that, that looks like a, a kind of warehouse type scene. Angus, are you there? There he is. There he is, we found you. Ah, oh. unmuting. Ah, oh, we've got two cameras going on. There's a bit of techno, this is techno to technology, guys. I'm sure we'll get there in the end. I'm here, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, you're absolutely all there, Angus. Great, got there. Good, that, good, that let's just crank up the volume here. Not seamless, so but almost seamless. Oh, you're, you're, um, you're, you're, you're on mute. Oh, I can't hear you. One second. I heard you for a bit and then, nope, nope. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Um, I can see you perfectly well, but I can't hear you. Such is technology. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Perfectly loud and clear, Perfect. Angus. Here we Perfect. go. Take right. two. Oh, Take we're two. Back. We're back. So we're down here in our in our warehouse, which is um, basically at the bottom of the boathouse. So, so as I said you know, right at the beginning here, we're right on the water. Uh, so actually, just to uh, just the right of me down there is a slipway uh, onto the water. And actually, I'm actually standing on a on a suspended floor. Um, so actually, on the, the extreme high tides uh, that we occasionally get here, uh, this warehouse is actually designed to flood. Um, so actually everything here, including the cast behind me, they're all raised up um, from the ground. Uh, so if anyone's talking about influence of, kind of maritime environments on normally on like an aging whiskey, uh, we have that exact same phenomenon uh, here in, in the warehouse. Um, and, you know, whiskey was one of my original passions that kind of got me into, into distillation. I spent a, had the privilege of spending a very short uh, stint up at Springbank Distillery in Campbelltown where I kind of uh, developed my passion for, for distillation, but obviously it kind of returned to gin, although I still love my, my single malt whiskey, but obviously the delight of using casks. And, you know, most gin, um, although traditionally, you know, gin was quite often aged in casks, and particularly sweeter varieties like, you know, Old Tom, um, a, a cask, a well-sourced cask and wood can add uh, some fantastic uh, notes to gin. So I have here uh, behind me just a kind of few casks. I have this one that's resting here, which is actually a uh, an American oak cask from uh, Newport in Portugal. Uh, we did a we did a Voyager series gin uh, called Guiding Star uh, that's now sadly sold out. Which was our um, we wanted to elevate the whole um, uh, slow gin category. So we did a slow and damson gin uh, where we had no sugar whatsoever. Uh, we based the recipe on the residual sugar content of the fruit and then we aged it in a cask on the lees of the port. So um, it's a Collietta cask and that means it's basically a single vintage tawny port. Um, so an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, gin there as well. And so I've got behind me a few different casks. Uh, can, everyone, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah the absolutely perfect. Um, yeah. So I've got behind me a few different casks. Uh, including, uh, we've got seven beautiful casks here from um, from uh, an amazing uh, winery called Chateau Clément, uh, which is in Sauterne in the Barsec region of France. And um, there, for those of you who know you know, Sauterne, obviously uh, traditionally dessert, uh, sweet wines, um, and uh, the most famous, the most expensive in the world, which is you know, called Chateau Iquem. Um And uh, Chateau Clément, uh, is regarded as being on a par with, with Chateau Clément. And, and in essence, the um, Ikem is regarded as the power and Clément as the finesse. So this is actually our Voyager series that I mentioned. So each one of our Voyager series, and we've done four to date, and we've got a release that some of you might have seen that we're doing with um, 
the two mix and shards chef Niall Keating that just won Great British Menu. That's uh, going to be coming out in, in August sometime. Um, and then the release after that will be, um, uh, uh, one of the releases after that will be with um, Chateau Clément here. So I've got uh, six beautiful casks. They're fine uh, you know, European uh, French oak cask that contain their beautiful uh, Sauterne wine. So what we've actually done here is create like we do with all the Voyager series. So each one of the Voyager series is a collaboration with either a world-renowned chef or an iconic winemaker. And the idea is to reflect their philosophy, style and approach to their craft in the liquid that we jointly develop with them. So the chefs have all been here to gin school, I've been over to the wineries um, and hand select the cask. So when we're working with a winery, it tends to go in a cask um, and in this case these beautiful um, casks. So I've actually just drawn just prior to going to the camera, uh, a lovely uh, little example. You can just start to see the kind of good, if I hold it up against my shirt, the beautiful golden uh, color of this um, wine. This has actually been in the cask for about five months now. Um, yeah, sorry, probably a little bit, like four months. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. So we fill the casks with about 60% um, uh, ABV, it tends to be. Um, you know, these casks have been used for wine, not for spirits previously. So if we if we put in if we fill at a much higher strength alcohol, we're in danger of stripping the cask. Uh, so we just lower the ABV slightly. So we want it to be soft and round. They're all named after one of the Sultan fruiters that I mentioned earlier in things. So these fruit schooners, these beautiful fruiters that were carried the citrus fruit and spices. And I said they carried cast of sherry, cast of port casks of uh, uh, wine and definitely casks of um, dessert wine. Um, so we've got, we've got casks here that have been hand sourced. It's a difficult job, someone has to do it. So I have to go and nose and taste all the wines and then hand select the casks, which is a lot of fun, banging the barrels, breathing in those aromas, trying to work out which cask is gonna give the best um, uh, aromas. And, um, and it's amazing that some of these, to think that these, some of these casks, this one behind me, is 100 years old. Um, so uh, not, not quite at the same time as some of the Sultan, as some And there's a lot of history, including some of the original Cooper's marks. Uh, but then some of the Sauterne casks and the lighter oak casks here, you know, they've been used twice before, but only filled with Sauterne. So we, we're creating here, in this case, a beautiful honeyed, uh, gin with uh, flavours of um, uh, apricots, uh, orange blossom. In fact, it, it's, it's, it is the gin equivalent to Sauterne. Um, but anyway, more about that later. Keep your eyes peeled for some of the future releases. Uh, we've got some uh, rum, some of our rum going into some of these uh, Sauterne casts as well. Um, so yeah, all very exciting. That's absolutely amazing, Angus, to see behind the scenes of what you're doing with um those casks and all the special stuff which is coming out. Now, I know that you're gonna go upstairs to um, the bar where we're gonna have a Q and A. Yep. Uh, Jason's waiting for you up there. So I, right. think, I, think, I think Jason's poured you a drink. I, I hope he has. Um, but the very important so thing, which I'm gonna, gonna say is that um, you did actually say the, the, the word Three I did. times, I did. And and, yeah. and can you? Uh, I've got two things to say. Well, uh, um, uh, there's someone uh, who's uh, I think online at the moment as well, who's actually added to the um, to the bottle of Solcom, which which is going to be one. It's um, the, the brand owner of Regal Rogue Vermouth, who says that he's going to double up the price. He's going to send in a, a bottle of Regal Rogue alongside the Sorkums to the lucky winner. So, um, we, can you announce what the word or the phrase was which, um, which is going to win that person that, that prize? I can indeed. It was Fruiters. There you go. And I think it's a word which was on the back of the bottle. It as is well. indeed. Yeah. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Angus. You go upstairs and get yourself a um, a, a G and T or whatever, and I think we're going to try and find the lucky winner.